Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is Vietnam veteran Mike Thornton. He also served as a Navy SEAL and is a recipient of the Medal of Honor. And Mike, thanks very much for your time with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Let's start at the beginning of your story. Uh, where were you born and raised? I was born in Greenville, South Carolina. As my father said, uh, at the young age of uh, six months, I crawled over to Spartanburg, and I was raised in the Spartanburg area. Was there a family history of service? Yes, my father, he served in World War II uh, from 37 to 46. Uh, all my uncles were all in the military. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I always knew I had dyslexia really bad. I always knew I was going to go in the military. I just didn't know when. Of course, when v Vietnam came up, it, uh, if you didn't have gr good grades, you were on your way to join the Army. But I always wanted to be a Navy frogman. And so I joined to be a, a UDT Underwater demolition. Uh, underwater demolition guy. Why did you always want to be a frogman? Saw uh, the movie The Five Sutherland Brothers, and uh, it's about a, a board from Portland, Oregon. They all died trying to save each other. And I, that's the way my father brought us up. That the family was everything. My dad only had a sixth grade education, but uh, he all, the family always came first. And uh, how they risked each other all their lives to save their older brother who was down in the engine department when the ship blew up. And then I saw that crazy movie with Richard Whitmire, uh, the UDTs in Korea. I said, that's me because I, I was a very good swimmer, a, a good athlete, but I had dyslexia so bad. I, I knew I was studying hard and they, my family knew I was studying hard, but I just didn't. Back then we just thought we were done. But as we know now today, there's a lot of brilliant people with dyslexia. How old were you when you joined the Navy? Uh, I joined on the 120-day program. I was actually 17 years old, and I went in uh, right after the summer. I joined the USS uh, Brewster, and it, they decommissioned it, and that way I, I opened up a door to go into BUDS training. So it, it was called Underwater Demolition Recruit Training back then. And later on in the, in the 70s, it became BUDS, basically when all the demolition SEAL team training. And you joined in 67? Yes, 67, yeah. Talk about BUDS training, SEALs training. I mean, that's some of the most intense. It was, uh, we started off with 129 guys in my class, and we actually uh, graduated with 12. Four of them were rolled back to the next class, and uh, but something that you'll never forget. And it's, uh, you know, like you say, it's very intense, uh, very hard. And when somebody tells me, though, they went to BUDS, and I said, what class you're in? He said, I don't remember well. You ever went? Through, you ever went through UDT SEAL training? You would remember. You'd never forget that. So, uh, it, it's a camaraderie of each other that you know it's, uh, that you'll never forget for the rest of your lives. And uh, many of these guys are still very close friends of mine, even fifty something years later. So they they test you in a number of different ways, but talk about how they test your camaraderie in that moment. I, you know, my father taught me something a long time. If it's to be, it's up to me. You know. And, you used to hear these guys, they quit, they ring the bell three times. Well, Why did you ring the bell? Well, my friend rang the bell. Well, he's not your friend if he's ringing the bell going through this type of train. What happens when the bullets are flying and the grenades are being tossed and all that? Those are the, those are the friends that you count on, and that's what the whole mission is. It's not about me. It's about us. It's about the team. It's about what we all believe in, and uh, we would all give our lives for the other guy, which... Uh, which we've done many, many times throughout my tours of Vietnam. So you never thought about ringing the bell? No. What happened after you completed SEAL training? I went to SEAL Team 1. I wanted to be a Navy frogman. I, we didn't even know when we went through training that uh, SEAL Team 1 was. And uh, I said, I want to be a Navy frogman. And uh, some of our guys went to UDT, uh, UDT 11, 12, and 13. And I went with myself and... Hal Kirkendall and Mike LaCaz and Timmy O'Farrell and a bunch of other guys, we all went to uh, SEAL Team, and we all did tours together in Vietnam. Our training class was still together, even though we were in Vietnam, we were in different positions, but we were all there, always there for each other. Now, the action for which you were awarded the Medal of Honor took place on your fourth tour Correct. in Vietnam. Describe your responsibilities and, and where you were on, on the first three. Uh, the other time I was over there aboard the Brister, and after that I went over with uh, Charlie Company, which is a SEAL team, which uh, Mike LaCaz and uh, Hal Kirkendall and a bunch of Kenny Myers and other guys, Wayne Hampton and a bunch of other guys were in my training class that went with us. And then uh, the next tour I was actually in Thailand and Laos. 
uh, working. Of course, we weren't there during this period of time. And, uh, and then I went back to Vietnam. And uh, I didn't have to go back. The CO asked me to please, would I go back over there? And I took six brand new kids. I'd never uh, Don Beam in them and uh, back to Vietnam to bring them back alive. And with the grace of God, they're all back home alive. What were you doing in Thailand and Laos? Can't really talk about that because okay. actually, we're, we're like I said, we weren't really there. <laughs> it, would, it came out 25 years later, you know, so uh, it was declassified, of course. Of course, we found out we had several Medal of Honor recipients receive the medal after uh, the declassification of the operations. All right, so it's your fourth tour. It's 1972, October 31st, exactly. Hall- Halloween 1972. How did the day start? Actually, it started pretty uh, easy. Uh, only two people really knew about the operation was Tommy Norris and myself. Uh, I had handpicked two of the Vietnamese SEALs, LDNs I'd worked with on previous tours to Vietnam. And one was named Dang and the other was named Quan. And uh, great guys. They were very, very combat ready. They had been in many, many firefights. You have to think, we were over there for six months to a year. These guys have spent their whole life fighting a war, you know, so they... And then uh, the eyes to be, uh, uh, Commodore Shively uh, was our in charge of all the Special Navy operation team. He was in charge of, with Tu Tai Hep, which was a commanding officer of all the Vietnamese SEALs. And the uh, at the time, the head of uh, military forces, they wanted us to run this operation up in near Qua Viet that the NVA had already taken over uh, Quan Tree in Way City, and we were trying to push them back. September of 1972, they pulled all the military forces out of Vietnam, with the exception of Navy SEALs, Army Special Forces, Marine Recon. And uh, we ran all the uh, operations then with the uh, support of the uh, Vietnamese Royal Marines and also the Vietnamese Army. And uh, then we had the Navy supported us with uh, aircraft and also uh, ships. And so did the Air Force and the Army, so A-10s and stuff like that to help give their air power support over that. And so uh, we went up north, myself and Tommy, and uh, nobody knew where we were going. And uh, we went 15 miles out and took a left turn and went up past North Vietnam. And uh, we will be vectored in by uh, the USS Morgan in Newport News, but we didn't know about the Newport News had to leave the, their site because uh, they had been heavily hit at Quan Tree, and they went down to give gunfire support to the city of Quan Tree to help hold back the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army. And so they vectored us in, and uh, uh, a vector is where they shoot an azimuth from the ship 15 miles off, and they shoot it. And so if you're one degree off 15 miles away, it's quite a difference, and uh, we they put us actually in the, the past north of the DMZ, and they thought it was the uh, the Qua Viet River, but it was actually the Viet uh, Ben Ha River, which was in North Vietnam, and so we inserted, and uh, everything else is history. Uh, we did what we call a horseshoe. You go five clicks and we go five clicks north and five clicks back out and hit the ocean, and we were trying to do a body snatch because the best way of intel is catch capturing somebody. And then you get, uh, you know, the most up-to-date intelligence at that period of time. And we thought we had, was doing pretty good. We had our, we caught, captured one guy and I had to eliminate the other guy. And uh, then we got surrounded and we were all wounded. And uh, except Tommy was shot in the head and lost uh, his eye and his front level part of his brain. I was hit seven times and Quan was hit once, but his lost his whole right end of his buttocks, and Dane was hit uh, several times in his back. So, uh, but here we are today. Wow. You talked about the body snatch, mm-hmm. and then the one, I believe, that tried to run, if I remember correctly. Yeah, he and, did. And you pursued him. I pursued him, and I chased him down, and I, I, I shot him uh, twice. And he fell to the, he, uh, as far as I know, he was uh, eliminated, is what I said. And then when I looked up, everybody was after me, and Tommy came off the top of this bunker and uh, shot a law rocket into the trees. He wasn't trying to hit anything. He was just trying to, a diversion, so I could escape back across the creek, back up to our, our you know, where there's nowhere to be safe, uh, basically. So 
we uh, we uh, engaged approximately 75 bad guys during that period of time. The four of you. Well, the the, the Thai officer never shot one round the whole time. Uh, he was told that he had been combat ready, but it came to find out uh, later on that he had never been in a firefight in his life. And uh, but that was a different issue. He he did his best. Uh, I put Quan over on my eastern flank, which I had the ocean if they tried to flank me that. I was out on the point. Uh, I had a, a big lagoon on the other side. Tommy and Dane were on top of the uh, uh, bunker, which is approximately 25 feet tall. And actually, it was a tunnel down inside of it. So if there was gunfire support coming in from the, the, the Navy shooting into there because they knew it was... Uh, they would go down in that tunnel and wait out till the, they quit firing, then they'd come back out. Our guest on Veterans Chronicles is Mike Thornton. He's a veteran of Vietnam, U.S. Navy SEAL, and a recipient of the Medal of Honor. We're in the middle of the story of the action that earned him uh, the Medal of Honor. And, Mike, uh, you were talking about how this rapid response unit was coming back at you out of the village. You had protection from your two other combat-ready friends. Yeah. You had a lagoon on one side, ocean over here. Yeah. And, but it's still essentially three on 75. Yeah, well, actually, it was four. It was Tommy, Dang, Dang had the radio, then Quan and me. And uh, actually, uh, at the uh, uh, the rear security we had, we could see as far as the eye could see. We could actually see the Ben Hall River, which is in North Vietnam. But 500 yards from there was a uh, sand dune just by itself. And during the firefight, I had already been wounded six times. And uh, at that period of time, I was the only one that had been wounded with shrapnel wounds from a grenade. Uh, Tommy told me to fall back with Quan and Ty, the young Vietnamese officer, and we fell back. And he was go, he was as we retracted back. Tommy was go uh, keep the bad guys chasing us, us, and we would uh, support his uh, uh, retraction back to the sand dune because that gave us 500 yards of just open beach. There was nothing in between us. Of course, during the firefight, they had dunes all over the place, so they would come over here or come over there. And what I'd do, I'd roll over here and eliminate several people. Then I'd fall back and eliminate and throw a couple of grenades, and I'd move up. So I gave them a false pretense about how many people we really had. They didn't know if we had 20 or 3 or 4, you know, but by me moving around and different, coming in different areas and eliminating those guys that— Gave him a false pretense about how many people we had fired because they knew there were Tommy was firing from up there on top of that thing, and Dang was up there shooting too, even though Tommy was on the radio with getting communications with uh, later on that actually actually picked us up off the coast of North Vietnam. You also mentioned uh, the shrapnel wounds he suffered from a grenade. I saw another uh, presentation you made where you explained how this grenade took a lot longer to. Yeah, go off, and you and the enemy were kind of uh, throwing it back and forth. We had we had captured a lot of grenades, and it was very. Uh, it wasn't like American grenade one thousand, two thousand, three thousand, boom, four thousand. Uh, this one you would pull the the, the, the pin, which was a, like a match, and when you did it, it it'd go off in eighteen thousand or twenty eight thousand. So. I knew I had enough time to throw it back and forth, but when it came back over the for the fifth time on my side, I said, this thing's going to blow off because I was already at 26,000 when I rolled over. The grenade went off and I was wounded. I yelled out, and uh, Tommy was yelling, Mike, buddy, Mike, buddy, and I, was, I never said another word. And I just laid on my back, and the, the guys came over the top of the doom, and I eliminated those guys. And uh, and that's when Tommy made up. the. I said, okay, let's fall back. To there, and he said, "I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stay up here, and when you guys retreat, then you guys can cover our retreat back." At that period of time, they saw us running back, and they, the charge came on again. And Tommy had been shot in the left temple. He was up actually shooting a law rocket, as he did before, and, uh, and him and uh, Dang were going to make their retreat down the hill to where we were. Uh, during that period of time, Tommy had gun uh, gunfire support with the USS Morgan. And the reason we knew how long the firefight lasted, uh, the Morgan started keeping the records of all our phone conversations. And it, the firefight lasted for two hours and 53 minutes, I think it was. And then uh, on Tommy's, uh, Dang came down off the hill and Dang said that Tommy was dead, Mike Tommy's was dead. And I said, y'all stay here. And then I went back. 
And they, even though they grabbed me, said, no, he's dead, Mike, he's shot in the head. I went back, I thought he was dead when I picked him up and threw him over my shoulder and I ran back with him. Five football fields away and then... Well, all these guys are shooting at me. All these guys are shooting at me and I was shot through my left calf then and fell to the ground and picked Tommy back up. And so I was actually wounded seven times that day and Tommy was shot in the head and Quan had uh, shot his right buttocks his, uh, off and uh, his femur muscle back here and he couldn't swim, and then Dang had two implanted you know, grenade hits in his back. So uh, I swam that day with Tommy on my back and Quan in front of me So for several hours until we got picked off the coast uh, by Woody Woodruff. Because when seals we go in, we always keep a uh, our extraction force. We always take a Navy seal. And we had another nine LDNMs aboard the uh, Vietnamese seals on board with Woody thank God that they didn't have to come in because at that period of time we had been already surrounded by over 600 bad guys so it was uh, knowing Woody just, just knowing his mentality he'd have still tried to come in to save our lives. There's so much you just mentioned that I want to follow up on but you mentioned after you were hit by the grenade you were kind of laying on your back and you mm-hmm. weren't speaking and you mentioned you eliminated the four uh, enemy fighters mm-hmm. how did you do that when you had just been wounded? Oh, <laughs> adrenaline does a lot of stuff for you. I promise you that. Uh, in the rush of the day, you, you, it's not about you. It's about what we're trying to do. I mean, it's like I tell all these kids, it's, there's only one obstacle in your life that can stop you, and that's yourself. So what are you going to do, sit there and cry, or you'll get up and do something about it? And as my father always said, if it's to be, it's up to me. And I knew I was the one that's going to have to stop those guys to get Matami and to Dang and Quan. so... Talk about the run to get to Tommy. What was that like? How were you dodging fire then, and what did you assess once you got to him? Oh, when I got, I could see Tommy on top of the dune, which was actually a bunker, and he was laying on his side, hanging over. And uh, I ran up the dune, and of course, bullets are flying everywhere. Uh, how they ever missed me on my return up there, I don't. I'll never know, but. They had several guys coming over the top where Tommy was, and I eliminated those guys, and I just grabbed Tommy. And at that period of time, I thought Tommy was dead. Started running down the bunker, and about that time, a five-inch from the USS Morgan hit and blew me approximately 25 feet in the air, and I could see Tommy going off my shoulders. And uh, it's really, it messes up your equilibrium, and it's like... The only way I can say is somebody was to cup their hands and come up behind you without you knowing and slapping you in the ears as hard as you can. And, uh, of course, you know the bad guys are still after you, uh, but you, you're trying to get back up off the ground. I could see Tommy, and I, but I was trying to get my senses back. And then I went over and grabbed Tommy, and at that time he said, Mike, buddy. And he then he went unconscious again, and I said, he's... The SOB is still alive, so I picked him up and ran off with him. Then I got shot through my left calf, fell to the ground, and then I picked him up again and ran with him to uh, to the sand dune where Ty, uh, well, actually Quan and Dang were there. Ty had already gotten in the water and swam off, but Quan and Dang, then we uh, leapfrogged to the ocean, and then I got Tommy through the surf zone, and after I got him through the surf zone, I put a life jacket on him and tied him to my back, and then I looked over and I saw Quan uh, struggling in the water. I could see Dang ahead of me, but Quan had been shot through his right buttocks area and his, his uh, femur muscle, the large muscle on the back of his leg, he couldn't swim. So I swam over and got him and put my arms underneath him, and he grabbed Tommy's neck and held Tommy on my back as we swam out to sea. So you've been wounded seven times, right. plus the concussion, right. and you're swimming with a guy on your back for how many hours? Uh, approximately three hours, and a guy in front of me. Actually, I had my arms, like if you had raised your arms, I'd put my arms and had you right in my body, because that way it would run us down. So in other words, when I, I, he could breathe, but using him was kind of like using a washboard to push the water around. And we had Tommy on top of my back, because one bad thing about Tommy, he was going into shock. I could tell that he was going, and that him being on top of my back, the warmth was with the water between my body and his body, it would help keep him from going in deep shock, but he ended up going into deep shock anyway. And with the grace of God, he's still here with us. I would imagine every ounce of what you went through in SEAL training. Paid <laughs> it, off for you that day. it was, poor guys are, 
I weighed about 228 pounds or 200, and I had a 31 inch waist, and I was in unbelievable shape. But uh, I couldn't even pull my. I got Tommy out, up on the boat with a, it was a Vietnamese junk uh, con made out of concrete. It's 39 feet long, and Woody was communicating, and they found uh, us, me, Quan, uh, Dang, Tommy, and I, and. Uh, Woody, had, he was debriefing Ty, the Vietnamese officer, about what happened, and he doesn't, Ty didn't remember anything. He was just uh, scared out of his wits. But later on, if I found out that, you know, he should have never been with us in the first place, uh, I kind of felt sorry for him. But uh, he, he's, he's alive today. Uh, I actually helped support him and his family, and actually Quan and his family to come to the States. Quan and his family have two fishing boats now near uh, uh, Seattle, Washington, and Ty, the officer, uh, he taught for 22 years at Harrisburg University in uh, Pennsylvania, but Dang never got out of the country. He was actually captured and assassinated. What did they do after you got to the boat? Did they send you to a hospital somewhere? No, we, we called the Newport News. Uh, we knew the Newport News had a doctor on board they came over with the Jonathan ladder and we put Tommy and carrying him up there and they couldn't get him through the door. So I just picked Tommy up and carried him through the Newport News down to the gurney, put him on the operating table. And then I went to debrief the uh, Admiral in charge of the Navy fleet out there and debriefed him and the commanding officer of the Newport News what happened. Tommy was picked up by a helicopter, flew to Da Nang. And then from Da Nang he was flown uh, by a 141 so they flew Tommy straight to Clark's Air Force Base, and his first surgery went for 19 hours. And uh, he went through 29 ma major surgeries after that. He was spent almost six and a half years in the hospital. And when I got my Medal of Honor, uh, Tommy was still in Bethesda, Maryland, here in the D.C. area. I kind of kidnapped him and took him to the White House. And Admiral Zumwalt was the chief of naval operations. And Mike, in a very short paragraph, why did you take him out of the hospital? I said, sir, I didn't leave him in Vietnam, and I sure wasn't going to leave him in the hospital when I wanted him next to me when I received the Medal of Honor from President Nixon. But I paid for that. I had to go to Admiral's Mass, so it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound like you regret the decision. Though. No, I don't. Um, How did you find out you were put in for the Medal of Honor or that you were about to receive it? Actually, Woody Woodruff told me. I, I said, are you crazy? You know, he said, no, you've been put in for the Medal of Honor, and that was March. Actually, it was all my, almost my birthday. Uh, March of 1973. I came back on January the 13th of 1973. It was my father's birthday. And, and what he said, have you heard? And I said, no, I, I, I heard nothing. He says, you've been s submitted for the Congressional Medal of Honor. I said, oh, you're crazy. And the next day I know, I get a letter. And actually, my father knew I was going to get it before I knew about getting it. And uh, daddy's never flown in his lifetime. And uh, he had because it came from the White House, he thought he had to fly up there. He said if he didn't, he would have drove or taken the train. <laughs> but uh, I think he was more excited about it than I was. Um, what was that day like? I know it meant a lot to you to have Tommy there next to you. Oh, yeah. Uh, I kept Tommy for four days. I figured I was already in trouble, so I might as well enjoy it. And he stayed four days with me. And uh, I put him underneath my brother's name and in the hotel, and uh, but it, it, it was exciting. We had a lot of fun, my mom and dad, my younger brother, and uh, my family were there. Uh, I wish my baby sister would have been there, but she was pregnant and was able to fly. Tommy wasn't even had received his medal, because he's received his medal almost three years after I received mine, but Tommy was there with me, and I was there when he received his medal from President Ford. What was the conversation like? Usually there's a private conversation with the president, at least now there is. I don't know if there was then. Did you get a chance to spend a little time with the president? Hey, uh, uh, Nixon, yeah. I've always respected Nixon. actually sent me a copy of every book he ever wrote. He's always said, but, you know, a lot of people don't know, during World War One, he was Secretary of the Navy. And he, he hugged my mom and gave her a very unbelievable, the president hugged me, nobody else. He never hugged nobody else. And he's... <laughs> Uh, at the time, Thomas Moore was the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Moore, and what a great gentleman. He took my mom and dad by hand and took them all through the White House and introduced them to Mrs. Nixon and to the president and stuff like that. So I was standing in there somewhere by myself. 
talk with my brother and Tommy, and uh, they were just treated with so much respect because my father, like I said, he only had a sixth grade education. And, uh, but he, you know, you could tell him that he was very, very excited to having that. He said, you know, Mike, that guy's just like me, just a good old boy. I said, yeah, Daddy, he's just a good old boy. <laughs> Talk about Tommy's recovery. Uh, when was he finally done with the surgery? Uh, I think his last surgery was about six and a half years into it. Uh, they had to put different plates because when they, the bullet entered, the left temple and it blew out the bursa, which the bursa is actually the sac that holds your brain in place. They had to go in, but the problem is uh, the plates they were putting in were, they didn't accept it, and they'd have to go back in and put another plate in and another plate in. And um, finally got everything in there, so he has three plates in his head. He's got one at the top, one on the side, and one in the front. It kind of, and of course, he, he lost uh, the front lobal part of his brain. Uh, which basically uh, it is with taste and stuff like that, and memory, uh, and memory. But the the major part of the brain's in the back, where Tommy wasn't injured there at all. And so he's a very lucky man, and he's still with us, and he's 75 years old and still raising horses up in Idaho. And I've seen interviews with both of you. He's oh, yeah. uh, perfectly loquacious and, <laughs> and, and, and everything else. When we went into uh, Vietnam, I... I so said, I think we're in the wrong place. I'm always giving a hard time. I said, if you listen to me, you still have your brain in your eye. And uh, I said, he said, well, what do you think we should do? I said, well, you're the officer in charge. I'll just give you my uh, stuff. But we're, we're Mutt and Jeff. We see each other about 10 times a year. And, and uh, uh, my lovely wife, Rainey, and uh, Teresa and Tommy and I would get together. And, and it's like a big family affair. We were just in Philadelphia with them giving away scholarships that my foundation gives to uh, children of, of, of Navy SEALs have lost, given the utmost they've given their lives. You were already great friends before this day. Oh, yeah, yeah. But what is the relationship like now? Well, we did a book by Honor Bound, and uh, actually Mr. Sloan is looking at doing the movie, and it's about 50-something years of two guys, of their love, and and how the, the, it hasn't disappeared. You know, uh, we're... We're together all the time, you know, throughout our lifetime, and he is the uh, godfather of my children. And uh, you know, it's, like I say, if it's to be, it's up to me. And we we keep that love and respect for each other. We're like Mutt and Jeff. I mean, he weighs 150 pounds soaking wet, and uh, of course, I weigh 250 something pounds soaking wet. So, <laughs> <laughs> but we argue all the time. We uh, we have fun together, but we. It's the respect and love that we have for each other. Difficult homecoming for a lot of Vietnam service members. Did you experience any of that? Uh, not really. Uh, Tommy still has some dreams. I, I had one dream, and uh, I had five of my friends killed. I had to go down and identify their bodies, and that was in 1969. And uh, I've never had another bad dream about that. Uh, of course, on this great day, freedom is not free. Freedom is written in blood. And and the, the the medal I wear, I don't think I deserve, never will feel I deserve it. Uh, there's some people says I do, but I wear it for the two me and 854,000 is given the utmost. And of course, you go to Arlington National Cemetery or some of the other Texas state cemeteries and the, all the other great national cemeteries we have throughout this nation, how many people have given the utmost to keep America free, and that's what gets me about it. Uh, and I don't like getting into politics, but somebody seems like they don't, they want to be socialist. And socialism has never worked in any country in the world. And But they say it's going to be different in America, and it's not. we got to keep what's made us great, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution of the United States. What is, it's worked for us all these years, and that's the reason why we're the greatest country in the world. And I've been to 90 countries in my lifetime, and I know how special this country is. You feel a responsibility when you wear that medal, don't you? Oh, yeah. It's, believe it or not, it's probably harder to wear it than it is to earn it in a lot of ways. Uh, it, it puts a great responsibility on the people. And uh, the, the, we love this nation so much. You know, I, I look at my uh, lovely wife and uh, the men and women who came back that are in a coffin. They never have another chance to hug their children or their great-grandchildren or their great-great-grandchildren, you know, and I have that luxury today because of the people that went before me, went with me, and it's going, keeping us free after me.
So I just wish that for all my great grandkids and my grandkids and stuff like that, that we continue serving this great nation called America. It's such a distinguished career, and we should point out that you served all the way as a Navy SEAL through Desert Storm. Real quick, what did you do in Desert Storm? I, I, I always say I was one of the original ten that started SEAL Team Six in 1980, the counter terrorist group, and I, I was working with the British SBSSES counter terrorist group in the 70s, and then we started SEAL Team Six in 1980, and of course with Delta Force and us and General Schultes or it was JSOC, and of course we all know what happened later on uh, uh, with what sick did taking down Bin Laden and stuff like that. I'm very proud of each each and every one of those young men who volunteer to go do do God's work, as I call it. And uh, from now on, it's going to be special forces, the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, and Coast Guard is is going to keep us working to keep us free in this great nation called America. But I served it, and then when they said I couldn't serve it no more, I said okay. It's just another chapter in the book. What's Mike Thornton going to do now? And you see what I do now. So many things to be proud of. Is there anything you're most proud of? My wife. Mike, we'll call time there. Unfortunately, we're out of it. Thank you, sir, for your service to our country. Thank you. And thank you for being with us today. All right. Thank you very much. Mike Thornton, recipient of the Medal of Honor, retired U.S. Navy SEAL, and a Vietnam War veteran. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles.